Hello and welcome to the Great Book Purge of 2024. Basically, my shelves are overflowing. This is my home library. I love it with my whole heart. This is my pride and joy. And if you went to the Marie Kondo school of things you own should only spark joy, then you'll agree with me that there is no place on these shelves for books that I A, don't like or don't want to talk about, and B, that I'm quite frankly never ever going to read. And so, I basically thought that today I could go through these shelves and pick out some books that I no longer need that could go to a better home because I saw that my local charity shop had done a call out for books. They need more books that they can sell and make some money for good causes, and so I thought, these are just sitting around on my shelves, they're never going to be touched again, they are just collecting dust, and so I'm going to go through my collection and pick out some books that I am going to donate. And I thought that would be a fun thing to film. I have actually done this once before, however, you will notice, <laughs> you're gonna notice some repeats, some repeat offenders, because, okay, so here's what happened. Basically, when I was about to set up this home library little situation that I have going on behind me, it's not a green screen, it's real, I moved all of my books from everywhere that I had books lying around, I moved them all into one room and then I went through and I picked out books that I no longer needed that I didn't want to end up in the home library. I put those in a separate pile and then I went traveling for like three months and in that time my lovely mother who I adore and love so much <laughs> very helpfully decided to help me do some cleaning and she moved all of those books from one place to another and did not know in her defense, she didn't know that they had been put into piles and so she just merged them. <laughs> she just merged everything. And so then when I moved everything into the home library, I was like, I will deal with that at a later date. That's future Jack's problem. Well, <laughs> this is future Jack. It's now my problem. And so I, I need to get rid of them because I basically have books that I want to add to the shelves that I can't add to the shelves because there is literally no space. And uh, I don't know if I'm quite at the stage yet where I want to buy another shelf. That feels like giving in. <laughs> that feels like accepting defeat, and I don't want to do that just yet. So there will come a time where I have to invest in another shelf for my home library, but today is not that day. Frankly, because I'm mentally not strong enough to build IKEA furniture today. I can't, I can't do that to myself. I shaved years off my life just making these five, and I still haven't even attached them properly. Like, there are parts of these bookshelves that I still need to finish building, and I just cannot bring myself to do it. I just, <laughs> no part of me wants to have to do flat pack in at least the next 365 days. So without further ado, I am going to go through these shelves and pick out some books that I'm going to be donating and make some room for some new books. So welcome to the video. First and foremost, let's do some books that I have duplicate copies of. Because I noticed the other day that I have so many copies of One Day by David Nichols <laughs> in various states, in varying states of um, sun bleachedness. This is one of the original copies of it. It looks pretty good. The spine, see I can't tell if the spine is meant to be this color or if it was always yellow. It looks to me like it's been sun bleached. And the reason I think that is because this copy is completely sun bleached. <laughs> like this is how I felt at the beginning of the year and this is how I feel now. <laughs> Already quite weary, you know? This, is, this has seen better days. This is my original copy of the book. I actually do remember reading this on holiday, like on the beach, and I think that's why it's so destroyed. I'm not entirely sure why I have two copies of it, but I now also have a third copy of it. This is a copy of One Day that I was given at the world premiere of the new Netflix series, which I got to host. So cool, I'll put some pictures just here, but I got to interview the cast. The show is wonderful. Ambika and Leo bring to life Emma and Dexter in magical ways. I think from episode seven, it just gets absolutely electric. I could not stop watching. So here's the thing. This copy has sentimental value because this was a really important event for me to get to, I felt so honored to get to be a part of that premiere, but this is the cover that I prefer, you know, the classic cover. What's that tweet that I saw yesterday? Hi mate, sorry to bother you, but I noticed the novel you're reading has a photo from the film version on the cover instead of the original cover, so me and everyone else in this Waterstones cafe are going to kick the fuck out of you. <laughs> I just, it's perfect. The perfect tweet does exist and it's that one. So this beaten up edition is gonna go to the charity shop. I think I am gonna keep both of these. Sorry, I already failed at the assignment, but they kind of have sentimental value to me, so I do wanna keep them as part of my collection. Other duplicates I have, um, there's this one. I bought a copy of this and the publisher sent me a copy of this, so I now have two, but this is 365 Poems for Life, an uplifting collection for every day of the year compiled by Ali Asiri. I actually 
actually worked with Ali at Hay Festival last year. She was wonderful. I met and interviewed Ali Asiri at last year's Hay Festival and she was so kind and she creates these really interesting anthologies. And I always say this, but I think poetry anthologies are a really great way of introducing yourself to new poets who you can then go and buy a full collection from, which is why I do recommend them. So this actually has like a little date at the corner of each page. Um, and so the idea is that you just read one poem every day, which I think is a really lovely way to start your morning. So let's see what today's poem is. Okay, so today is the 19th of February when I'm filming this. This is a poem called Scaffolding by Seamus Heaney. Masons, when they start up on a building, are careful to test out the scaffolding. Make sure that planks won't slip at busy points, secure all ladders, tighten bolted joints. And yet, all this comes down when the job's done, showing off walls of sure and solid stone. So if, my dear, there sometimes seems to be old bridges breaking between you and me, never fear. We may let the scaffolds fall, confident that we have built our wall. That was so nice! I love this concept, I like this a lot, but I do have two copies of it, and so I think someone else will benefit from reading this. Now, I actually have a whole section on my shelf just down here for books that I have multiple copies of. So the fact that I'm now gonna clear this is phenomenal, I'm very excited about it. Like look at <laughs> the number of books I have duplicate copies of. Firstly, this is the Drake Poetry Collection. Titles Ruin Everything, Stream of Consciousness by Kenza Samir and Aubrey Graham. This, I mean, look, in terms of value for money, there's literally one line per page, if that. In the award for Rip Off of the Century, this is certainly a nominee, but not the winner. It's nominated for the sheer fact that there are hardly any pages. What wins the award for Rip Off of the Year is that I somehow accidentally got charged twice for this and sent two copies of it. I definitely only purchased it once, but they did charge me twice, they sent it to me twice, and this book costs like $40 because the shipping was so expensive. So I spent $80 on a book that wasn't even good, that literally felt like things that should have been left on the cutting room floor. For example, there are two types of women in this world, women who like giving head and women who I don't like. So I don't even know if this is worth giving to charity, but maybe someone will enjoy it. The book, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, is another book that for some reason I have three copies of, so I'm actually gonna get rid of two of them. It's a really courageous love story from the Holocaust. I found it such a page turner, it completely got me out of a reading slump, but I frankly don't need three copies of this book, and so two are going to new homes. Again, I worked with um, Karen M. McManus on the launch of this book, You'll Be the Death of Me. The copy that I read and that I've underlined and annotated and that I'm keeping is down there, but in the process of doing that interview, I just kept being handed copies of this book and somehow ended up with all of them at my house. This is about three friends who used to be close and decided to skip school for the day in a kind of like, Francis Bueller's day off sort of vibe, and then accidentally stumble onto a murder scene. And so the rest of the book is kind of an investigation into that. These copies also have sprayed edges. I really don't know how I feel about sprayed edges. I think they look really good on hardback books, but I don't always think they look great on paperback. Sometimes I think it's a little tacky almost. So I'm not sure about this. And I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. Another book I have two copies of is Small Pleasures because I bought one copy and then I was sent one copy from the Women's Prize. It was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. It's a really lovely book about a woman who is a journalist and then she ends up discovering this story about a virgin birth. So someone who is claiming that they are the new Virgin Mary, essentially. And so she investigates it. I think that there's something that happens basically at the very end of the book, which is insane and just sort of feels a little bit tacked on at the end. I thought that was crazy and totally derails the rest of the book, which is quite small and ordinary and focuses on the small pleasures of life. And I really love that. Um, it has a whack ending, like the ending is insane. But aside from that, I really liked this book. So the ending, yeah, did kind of take a star off of this for me. But this copy of Small Pleasures is going to go to someone who will get a lot of pleasure from it, I'm sure. Also one of my favorite book covers ever, ever, ever. I just, I'm obsessed with this. The queen of the bingeable book, Taylor Jenkins Reid. I have this copy of Daisy Jones and the Six. And I also have another copy of this book right here. I don't know why. I. How does this happen? I don't know if I just have like short-term memory loss or something. I literally have the brain of a goldfish, I think. This book reads like a Netflix documentary. It's based on Fleetwood Mac. It's about this band, the trials and tribulations of being in that band. I'm sure you know it was recently turned into a really amazing TV show. And it's the kind of book that you can just devour. It's so great. It feels really, really immersive. I also highly recommend listening to the audiobook of this because there's a full cast of actors. I thought this was addictive. I recommend Taylor Jenkins read books to everyone because they are literally laced with crack. I still wish they had better covers, like I really think that this could have been so much better, especially with all of the music motifs. I think the same about Carrie Soto is back. Like this is a book about a tennis star, it could have had a really great 
tennis theme, and yet they just look a bit crap. I'm praying for the day when nice editions of Taylor Jenkins Reid's books are released, but until that day, I don't need two copies of this one. Hopefully these ones will also be gone at some point and I can replace them with a really lovely cover. This has also made me realize I have copies of this book in both paperback and hardback, which I don't need. It's unfortunately just buried under <laughs> six other books. Oh my God. I just caught it. Whoa. Okay. And dropped it at the final moment anyway. So I have these two copies of this book, both of these covers. Which one would you guys keep? Let me know. I think I'm gonna go for the hardback, actually. I don't love either. I think this one is marginally better, but I just wish this was a cool, minimalistic, very geometric, like Wes Anderson style tennis court or something, you know? Could have been so great. Could have been amazing. Will they ever not fumble the bag with a Taylor Jenkins recover? I don't know. I also, for some reason, have two copies of Sanjeev Sahota's The Year of the Runaways. This is a book kind of about the diaspora, about immigration, about moving to the UK. It's about the financial and emotional price people have to pay to move to England from India and it explores assimilation versus hostility and it's interesting I actually studied this at university and I think that I might have accidentally picked up someone else's copy of this book because that's the only explanation I can have for having two because while I was a student there's no way I was going to accidentally buy two copies of a book without returning one of them. Oh I can see I bought this originally from a charity shop for $1.99 so if I accidentally stole your copy of this book at university, I am so sorry. Only now am I realizing that I have two copies of it and <laughs> I, I feel terrible. So if anyone I used to have seminars on post-colonial literature is watching this video and realizes they no longer have their copy of this book, I stole it and I'm so sorry. DM me, let's reconnect, send me a message, I will return this to you. But if not, uh, then this is, gonna go to a new home. Milk and Honey by Rupi Kaur, no comment. Not sure why I have one copy of this, let alone two. A Man Called Uva, this is by Frederick Backman. Frederick Backman writes these funny, charming character studies about people that you just instantly connect with. And they're always that perfect mix of like funny, but moving. They're always a little bit silly, a little bit goofy, but they also have a heartfelt twist and A Man Called Uva is no exception. They recently made a movie called A Man Called Otto. I would love to know why they felt the need to change the name. It's giving when Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was changed to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Like, still confused about that. The movie is fine, the book is considerably better. I just read his other book, Anxious People, and really enjoyed it. So yeah, I am looking forward to exploring more Frederick Backman. Loads of you always comment on my videos saying that you love his series Bear Town as well. So um, yeah, this is an interesting author for me, but I'm looking forward to someone else getting to read this. We Were Liars. So I have this copy, but I also have this copy. And I am a magpie, I like shiny things. So I'm keeping the one that has the foiling and getting rid of the one that doesn't. It's about a family who always go away to this vacation home and the daughter had this really severe head injury. And the book is really engaging because you really feel like you are inside her head as she is starting to uncover secrets within her own family. And I thought this was electric, it's a book you can read in one sitting, it's compelling, super smart, super unforgettable. I really enjoyed We Were Liars, but I don't need two copies of it. Oh, I think that potentially, because there's a sequel now called Family of Liars, I think potentially I was sent this copy with the original as well. That might be why I have two copies of this book, but I need to read the sequel. The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. I have two copies of this because I read it and loved it and then I was sent a signed copy of it. And so I went back through and re-annotated my signed copy with all of my annotations from my original copy so that I can keep my signed copy and therefore donate this one. It's kind of Romeo and Juliet if it was set on Cyprus and it's really beautiful, really, really powerful. I love this book. Some of it is told from the perspective of a fig tree, which if you've read The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, you need to read. And then final book that I have a duplicate copy of is Just Kids by Patti Smith. So this is going to a new home. Now is where we get savage because now we're going through books that I think that I'm either never going to read or just don't want as part of my collection anymore. So let's have a little look. Okay, well this one's pretty silly because I have a copy of this book, it's called Terms and Conditions. But what I didn't realize is that this was a sequel. I didn't realize it until I got it home and realized there's a big two on the spine. The first book in the series is called The Fine Print and I think I was curious enough to read one of these books but not two of them. So I'm kind of like, am I ever going to read the first one in this series? Probably not. Therefore, I'm never going to read this one, which is number two. So it might be time that Terms and Conditions by Lauren Asher got the chart, but I know this is a real book talk favorite. So let me know if I'm making a mistake here. I'm going to predict that I'm not. <laughs> oh my God, my number one enemy. This copy of this book 
<laughs> drives me insane. I read it while I was at university. It's Gone With The Wind by Margaret Mitchell and this is the spine. It's horrible! Sometimes I spot it and it gives me like a jump scare moment. It just, it looks so terrible on my shelf. And quite frankly, it needs to go. If you already put her on the cover, why would she need to be on the spine too? She has the eyes that like follow you around the room and I need it out of my life. If this book cover has zero haters, I am dead. I'm, it, it's because I no longer exist. <laughs> Free me from the shackles of that book being on my shelves. Please. I also have this copy of Maeve Henry's Just a Boy, and I think it's terrifying. I can't explain why this cover feels like it's haunted to me. It, there's something so disturbing about it. I don't know what this is about. I feel like I'm never going to get to know. So this, someone else will enjoy this. Snowflower and the Secret Fan is described as achingly beautiful, a marvel of imagination, but I guess we'll never know. I guess we'll never know. See ya! Oh, I just found another duplicate. I have two copies of The Dog of the North, one in paperback and one in hardback. Haven't read either for some reason, but yeah, I think that The Dog of the North definitely just isn't a book that I need two copies of, so this one is getting the chop because I'd just rather keep the hardback version that I have. And then this one is called Are You Watching? It's by Vincent Ralph. One killer, 13 victims, a million viewers. I don't know why, but this one is just calling out to me and saying, you're never gonna read that. I haven't thought about it since the day it landed on my shelf. I just, I, I don't really enjoy thrillers that much. And I feel like if I was sent this in December 2019 and still haven't read it, I'm probably never going to, right? Sarah J Mass. This book is taking up prime real estate on my shelves. Like that's a chunky book and The House of Earth and Blood, I'm never gonna read that. Bound by Blood, Tempted by Desire. Just sounds a bit incesty to me. <laughs> I bought this book because I was gonna do a video on books that were cancelled on TikTok and I just never got around to it. And so someone else can have it. And I just think without that on my shelf, I can fill the space it's taking up with something I actually want to read. Speaking of which, I could also get rid of my copy of A Court of Thorns and Roses. I have to say, I really hate <laughs> the Sarah J Mass blueprint of a something of something and something. A house of earth and blood, a court of thorns and roses. It just sounds like a random word generator that has no imagination. What does it mean? What does it mean? It's telling me nothing, it's giving me nothing. The reason I have this one is just pure FOMO. Literary FOMO. Other people talk about this book and I, it makes me curious. Look! A Court of Thorns and Roses, A Court of Mist and Fury, A Court of Wings and Ruin, A Court of Frost and Starlight? Be so serious. Be so for real right now. I understand committing to the bit, having an author identity, whatever. But to do it for one series and then carry it on to the next one? These aren't even linked. Like the next series, House of Sky of Breath, are you serious? Please. I'm, no, sorry, I'm not reading that. Oh, let's see, I know I've spoken about this one on my channel before, but The Secret Life of Bees makes me viscerally very angry because <laughs> this cover, frankly, sucks. It's so bad. Again, like I was talking about with the Taylor Jenkins read books that are about music or that are about tennis, like there's such an obvious motif you could use on the cover of the book. All of the ingredients are sitting right there. They're chopped, they're prepared in front of you, and yet, this is so undercooked. This is The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kid, and you have to be Sue Monk kidding me. This had so much potential, and yet this is what we got. Why is it not this really lovely, vibrant yellow, or like mustard color? Why is the spine blue? What about The Secret Life of Bees gives you blue? No, 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 I've actually heard really good things about this book. <laughs> I think that's why I own a copy of it. It's superficial, I understand that, but until they can deliver me a good cover of this book, I don't want it near me. Sorry. My hateritis is flaring up. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry about it. This next one is The Names They Gave Us. Again, it just looks a bit naff. The Names They Gave Us. Who we are is written in the stars. It's giving Ellie Golding lyric. Lucy has her perfect summer planned out. Perfect boyfriend, perfect job, and quality time with her perfect parents. Then her mum's cancer comes back, and suddenly life makes no sense. Before she knows it, Lucy finds herself agreeing to volunteer as a counsellor at a camp for troubled kids, where lives are more different from her own than she could have imagined possible. Here, Lucy meets the dashing but mysterious fellow counsellor Jones, who will change the way she sees the world forever. With tragedy hovering at the edges of Lucy's life, this summer she must find out who she really is and what it means to love. <sighs> 
I'm kind of torn, I'm on the fence with this one. Like, it doesn't sound bad necessarily, but I just don't think it's something I'm ever going to be like, that's what I want to read today. That is what I want to spend time reading. So, okay, fine, I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> okay, before we move on to unhauling more books, I just wanted to let you know that today's video is very, very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. Now, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building a website or an online brand, and they have hundreds of incredible templates, so you don't need any web development experience, you don't need to be an expert in coding. They have really done all of the hard work for you, all of the legwork has been done by them, so you can just flex your creative muscles. Using their templates as a starting point, you can also also add features like a blog feature so you can share what's going on behind the scenes. They have a way of making an email sign up list so you can get more people to listen to what you have to say. And there are great analytical features. So if this all sounds good to you, you can actually head to squarespace.com right now for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch your beautiful new brand, you can head to squarespace.com slash Jack Edwards and use the code Jack Edwards to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. My whole career has been because I made a website of my own. It's one of the best things I ever did, so I highly encourage you to do the same, and thank you so, so much to Squarespace for working with me on this video. Oh, this one also makes me quite annoyed. This is A Certain Hunger. This is the US edition of this book. It's so much nicer, and actually, I was at Art Basel in Miami, and I found the original painting. I found the painting that is on the cover of this book being sold, and I just think, please abolish these neon covers for literary fiction novels. We don't no one wants this. Like, we could have had Renaissance painting and instead we got Stabilo highlighter. What did the UK do to deserve this? Actually, we know what we did. <laughs> the UK knows what it did. Maybe we don't deserve nice things. But I just feel sad. <laughs> I just, I'm mourning the loss of the potential of this cover. So I am keeping this book for now, but just know that its days are numbered. Once I track down the US edition of this book, I will be adding it to my collection and this one will be getting the chop. It's gonna be chopped like that pineapple, trust me. For now, it lives to see another day. Okay, yeah, these have gotta go. I have three books by this one author. I think his publishers just kept sending them to me and I just feel like I'm never ever gonna read them, you know? Do you know what else is very frustrating? Why is that a series and one of them is bigger than the other two? Jail, lock it up. Why do they not match? That's infuriating to me. Sorry, Gary Donnelly. Sorry to that man. With peace and love, these books look like the most boring thing I've ever seen. Like, it's giving the, th the book your dad buys at the airport. You know, blood will be born, killing in your... What does that even mean? Blood will be born. Blood will be born, killing in your name, and never ask the dead. Never ask them what? I guess we'll never know. Another duplicate I just found is that I have two copies of the Book Lovers Quiz Book. I actually really like this cover. I think that's very cute and would make a great gift for someone. I just don't need two of them, and so... This is gonna go to another home. What else do we have here? Oh, this one's kind of crazy. <laughs> so there's this book called The List. It's by Yomi Adegoke. And I guess the publishers <laughs> just thought I would really love this book because they sent me not one, not two, but three different versions of this book called The List. And the worst part is I did read it and hated it. <laughs> I'm obviously so grateful when a publishing house thinks I'll really love a book and sends it to me, like that is the most exciting thing ever. And I was pumped about this book, it's about a social media couple where one of them gets cancelled for indecent behaviour, and his partner, who he's engaged to be married to, has always been such a huge advocate for believing victims. And so what does she do when suddenly her partner is the one being accused? I think it had so much potential and just did nothing with it. Like. To me, this is actually a very problematic book. I spoke about it a little bit in my, <laughs> well, in my worst books of 2023 video, which says everything you need to know. So I definitely don't need three copies of this. I think the one that I like the most is this purple one. And so these two copies of the list, actually, this can be donated. I think that, oh yeah, this is an uncorrected advanced proof. So I actually think I can't donate this. I'll see if a friend wants to read it. Basically, as a book critic, you're sometimes sent these advanced reader's copies. I love that name, by the way, because it's called an advanced reader's copy, as in like you are reading it in advance of publication. But to me, I choose to read it as that they're complimenting me, saying I'm an advanced reader. <laughs> you know, like I'm in the top set at school for English. It's delusional and it's incorrect. It's not what they mean at all. They're not calling me an advanced reader. They're saying you are reading this in advance. <laughs> But it's all about the lies we tell ourselves, right? It's all about the little ways we can find in this life to make ourselves feel good. It's giving the energy of someone who was talented at school and hasn't 
achieved anything since. <laughs> That's very much the energy I'm giving with this. But as Lord said, let me live that fantasy. Okay, so anyway, this is my advanced reader's copy, so I actually can't resell this or like let a charity shop resell it. So with these, I usually just re-gift to friends who want to read the book. Um, and you know, I'd be intrigued to discuss this with someone else. So yeah, those two uh, are not gonna be on my shelves anymore, but this one I will keep because actually people often ask me why I keep books that I didn't enjoy. And the reason for that is because I make content about books. And so it helps me to have like physical copies that I can refer back to and hold up. I think it's much more interesting visually for me to be able to like hold up a book and flick through it when I make these videos and draw from quotes and give you a proper detailed review based on my annotations. So yeah, that's why I do keep uh, some of the books that I didn't actually love, just for content, you know? Oh, I just realized I have two copies of this book. I have multiple copies of The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. This, I will happily donate, even though I absolutely loved it, because I want someone else to have the chance to read this. And if they can get a little bargain on it in a charity shop, even better. This is an essay from 1963, and it's James Baldwin's impassioned plea to, in his words, end the racial nightmare in America. It's about galvanizing a nation and giving a voice to the civil rights movement. It's really, really powerful stuff. I implore everyone to read this. It should be required reading. And so I will happily donate this because I think everyone should read it. This copy of a book called The Nun, I also feel is haunted. Like if there was a Ouija board in this room, it would tell me to get rid of this book, I feel. Cause it's, it's just bad vibes. <laughs> this copy of this book is bad vibes. I feel like even removing it from this random little piece of cardboard that it's... Why does it need a piece of cardboard to contain it? What is that about? I just, I feel like even the fact that I've opened it has like released a spirit into this room. This feels like something from a horror movie. I, I just, I can't explain it. Even the fact that the top of this book is sprayed black, like but the other edges aren't. Like, is that intentional? Is it meant to be like that? Is it stay? I don't know. And I hate it. I just need this book gone. And then when I saw this online, I thought it was going to be absolutely beautiful. And then it came and it's terrible quality. This is Johnson's Dictionary, a dictionary of the English language. And first of all, why is it printed like that? Like half the page has been printed on and the other half just hasn't. Whereas in this one, because it was basically divided up into two volumes, on this version it fills up the entire page. So I'm just not really sure why these don't match. Even the spines don't match each other. Like that white line doesn't match up. It's meant to be a set, but they don't match. <sighs> There's a special place in hell. <laughs> For whoever did this, I would like a copy of Samuel Johnson's English Dictionary, but it's not going to be these ones. So I'm getting rid of these and I'm going to repurchase and do it properly. When I saw them online, I really thought they were going to be this like gorgeous, like hardback, hardcover that I could return back to and flick through all the time. And it's just, it's just not. And now, oh, I guess there's this one. This is a book that I wrote my extended project on when I was doing my A-levels. There's a thing called the EPQ. It's like an extra qualification you can get. Oh no, this was my history coursework. I wrote my history coursework on this book. What was I using as a bookmark at the time? This random little voucher, I guess. Well, anyway, it's quite a controversial book. It's called Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans and the Holocaust. It's actually a book that I really strongly disagreed with in my essay. Basically, the task of the essay was to engage in historiography, so people talking about history and then analyze it, critique it. I really didn't like this book. To sum up a huge book into just an elevator pitch, I guess, the argument of this book is that the Holocaust could only have happened in Germany. It talks about how that kind of genocide was essentially the logical conclusion of German behavior over history. And uh, I don't know, it intentionally presents information in a kind of misleading way. It also fails to mention a lot of other historical contexts from around the world where other genocides have and still do happen. So I feel like I've kept it all these years because I wrote an essay on it and because it was interesting to disagree with. But at the same time, do I want a book called Hitler's Willing Executioners on my shelf? Probably not. Actually, this reminds me of a story. When I was at school, they took photos for a new school prospectus, like for potential future students. And they wanted to take a photo of me. So there is like a picture of me in the school library, very on brand. <laughs> From an early age, I knew my brand, but they asked me like, so they have the camera crew come in and they're like, okay, we're gonna take some pictures of you in the library. So the picture is me, cause I was in year 11 at the time, leaning against one of the shelves in the library. For some reason, no one checked what the books behind me said. No one realized that the shelf they had made me lean against and had my photo taken in front of was one of the history shelves. And it was all of the books 
about the Nazis. And so behind me, it's like, Nazi, 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 not like, what? And so the photo had to be retaken, like they had to bring the photographer back to the school a month later when they realized their mistake, because they were like, this is too bad, we actually can't even Photoshop this disaster on such a large scale that we've accidentally put like a 15 year old boy in front of loads of signs that say Nazi. <laughs> like, it's just awful. How did that even happen? Obviously, I feel like it's not my fault because I was just doing what I was told and also they were behind me, like I wasn't facing the books. How did no one notice that all of the books were about the Nazis? Please. So yeah, I feel like that's not really how you want to advertise your school um, to upcoming students, you know what I mean? Anyway, I've also just remembered that I have multiple copies of these two Joan Didion books, Slouching Towards Bethlehem and Play As It Lays. I love these two books so much, I want everyone to read them, so I will be donating them so that someone can. That's actually a lot of books. I'm gonna count them. Okay, that is 43 books that I'm getting rid of. That's good. That is... We've made some serious space on these shelves. I'm actually impressed by my willpower to do this, and I've put them all to one side, so these actually are going to be removed <laughs> from this house and not accidentally restocked on the shelves like last time. But anyway, thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed. I hope that this motivated you to maybe donate some books that you don't need, that someone else could really, really appreciate, and that a charity could really benefit from. All my social media is down below. All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you very, very soon. Bye! -bye.